right. Well, let's kick things off. So welcome, everybody. Um, and thank you for joining us for this webinar uh, called Psychedelic Law Landscapes Navigating Decriminalization and Regulatory Reforms. My name is Kyle Buller. I'm one of the co-founders here at Psychedelics Today and really honored to have Courtney Barnes join us today for this presentation. Um, it's always a pleasure working with you, Courtney. Just always love your insights and um, how you really kind of like contextualize the the field as it's growing and evolving, um, especially in the in the legal landscape. So, I'll pass it over to you. Um, I'll let you do a little bit more of a, an intro and uh, kick off your presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Courtney Barnes. I am an attorney based in LA. Our law firm is in New York City, and we have attorneys sort of all over the country, but. I've been part of the psychedelics policy reform movement since the drafting of Denver's decriminalization of psilocybin initiative back in 2019. And today we're going to get into a presentation really that goes into sort of how drugs are regulated, what's going on with the grassroots decriminalization and policy reform movement that's happening from the local and state level, um, how to enact reform at both the local, state, and federal level, or all three, and um, sort of where we're looking federally from a kind of uh, lens going into 2024 and beyond. So I'm excited to present this slideshow for you all and give you all in sort of past, present, and future of psychedelics in the United States. Okay, can everyone kind of, is that centered to everyone? Yep, I see it, great. Okay, so... Welcome to Psychedelic Law Landscapes, Navigating Decriminalization and Regulatory Reforms. Again, I my name is Courtney Barnes. I serve as counsel at Feldman Legal Advisors, a cannabis and psychedelics um, policy and business law firm. So today we're gonna talk about the regulation of psychedelics, the local policy reform movement, the state policy reform movement, pending legislation and initiatives, and federal updates. So I'm going to try to do this in about 50 minutes to give us a few, a little bit of time for questions, but you can always find me. I'll share my contact information at the end if, if there's anything we don't get to, but we should cover a lot of ground. So let just to give everyone a primer, we'll sort of start from the top and then work our way down to the more granular areas of interest. So what are psychedelics broadly, right? Um, psychoactive chemicals are plants that alter perception, mood, and cognitive processes. This is a very basic definition. We can get esoteric and spiritual and um, or more scientific and granular, but as a, as a general sense, this is kind of the definition that is widely used. For the purposes of understanding the policy reform movement and the legalization, decriminalization, and regulation of psychedelics, the term that's used in federal and state law is hallucinogens. And hallucinogens, this is from the DEA fact sheet, but they define, the DEA defines hallucinogens are, um, you know, found in plants and fungi or can be synthetically produced and are among the oldest known group of drugs used for their ability to alter human perception and mood. So we'll talk about the United States Controlled Substances Act as well as each state's Controlled Substances Act. But when you're looking for psychedelics in law or trying to find the statutes where they're regulated, they're gonna be classified as hallucinogens under federal law. So the United States Controlled Substances Act of 1970 provides the overarching landscape of how psychedelics are regulated in the United States. Um, you know, the first major piece of federal legislation regulating controlled substances or dangerous substances, as it was originally referred to, was enacted back in 1887, and it was related to curbing opium trafficking between the United States and China. Congress subsequently adopted a variety of other pieces of federal legislation regulating dangerous drugs um, between you know, the late 1880s and on. And in 1970, Nixon passed the US Controlled Substances Act to sort of bring all of those federal drug laws together into one uniform body of law. And the Controlled Substances Act or CSA as I'm going to refer to it throughout this presentation 
regulates the possession, manufacture, and sale of psychedelics in the United States. As I mentioned, it combined all federal drug laws into one, and it uses five schedules or categories based on abuse potential and medical use to determine how each class or of substance will be regulated. So it also includes a mechanism for moving substances from one schedule to another, and we'll talk in more detail about that. But for the most part, what you want to know is the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 is the federal law that's sort of the overarching, most powerful drug law in the United States that describes how psychedelics are classified and regulated um, and handled. So every other state or every state in the United States has adopted its own version of the Controlled Substances Act. Most states regulate psychedelics akin to federal law and mirror the scheduling regime that the CSA uses. So that's your five schedules. Um, you know, there's subcategories within those schedules, but for the most part, states follow federal law. What is different between each state and how they regulate Controlled Substances Act is generally relating to penalties. There are some other pieces when it comes to licensing and um, other restrictions, but as you can see here, penalties are where, really where states kind of get creative, and penalties can vary on a variety of different factors from, you know, how much of a psilocybin did you possess when you were arrested, were you intending or were you engaging in the sale or distribution of that psychedelic compound, narcotic or non-narcotic drugs, um, that's been a kind of old school category where they sort of parse narcotics and higher penalties. Um, whether minors were involved in whatever un illegal activity you were engaging in, and then where you were engaging in that activity. So if you were in a school zone or near a, you know, like arcade for children or a pool or things like that, and states vary between how they um, determine, you know, what of these categories is most important to them. But yeah, from, the, from a psychedelic standpoint, the most important thing to know is that every state has their own and psychedelics are regulated under both federal and state law in the United States. So we're getting to where we are in, in our policy reform movement. Right now, psychedelics are still classified as Schedule I controlled substances, meaning they are illegal to possess, manufacture, and sell without a DEA license. Schedule one is the most restrictive category. Schedule one substances in the United States are determined by the DEA to have a high potential for abuse, no accepted medical use and treatment in the United States, and a lack of accepted safety for use under medical supervision. So essentially no medical value, highly addictive or dangerous. Um, as we'll you know, discuss, clearly that's the research indicates otherwise when it comes to every psychedelic compound, but that's where we're at right now. So under federal and almost every state law, psychedelics as a whole are illegal to possess and sell and use in transport and pretty much any other verb you can come up with besides research pursuant to a license. Examples of Schedule One controlled substances. So... Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. There we go. Um, as you can see here, DMT, Ibogaine, Mescaline, LSD, cannabis, MDMA, psilocybin, psilocin, peyote, heroin. There are more, but that gets the point across. These are all Schedule One controlled substances under federal law and essentially every state law. When it comes to cannabis, now we're seeing psilocybin and some of these other plant-based psychedelics have alternative regulatory regimes under state law. The scheduling component is generally remains intact, which continues to treat um, all of these compounds as schedule one controlled substances with very limited exception. That said, that's kind of where the history of psychedelics regulation in the United States, it's sort of where we're at the starting point of the movement. So everything is essentially illegal for most people's intents and purposes. That said, starting in May, 2019, we began to see this grassroots policy reform movement um, take place. And 
So in May 2019, Denver decriminalizes psilocybin through a voter initiative. And this was the first city in the country to pass any sort of policy reform relating to the decriminalization of psychedelics specifically. Denver's ordinance was psilocybin specific, but it decriminalized or more technically for local, re local policy reform, deprioritize the enforcement of state and state laws, um, criminalizing the possession, use, sharing, and um, cultivation of psilocybin by adults 21 years of age and older. So Denver was the first. Later that year, pretty much, I think the next month in June 2019, Oakland became the first city to pass a resolution decriminalizing, more technically deprioritizing the law enforcement of your natural psychedelic compounds. So not just psilocybin, but uh, DMT, ibogaine, mescaline, psilocybin, psilocin. And those two were sort of the domino effect that we've seen now. We have, I, my explicit count is 25, but I believe that there are probably a few more cities or towns that have passed resolutions or enforcement discretion policies across the country. I have 25 in a spreadsheet. Um, you know, always happy to be wrong there because the more the merrier. But you can see with this timeline, 2022, we sort of see the ball rolling. I think there was three different municipalities as well as Oregon, which passed its uh, psilocybin access program via Measure 109. And we'll talk more about that in later slides. And then, you know, 2021, we see even more in 2022 and it continues to 2022. There's a little bit of a lull, but um, we continue to see a lot of progress. So, you know, just to, if in case you can't read the slides, Somerville, Cambridge, Washington County, Northampton, Grand Rapids, Seattle, Arcata, East Hampton, Detroit, Court Townsend, all passed policy reform in 2021. And then Hazel Park, Mich Michigan, West Hollywood, California, San Francisco, California, adopt resolutions in 2022. And Colorado voters also passed ballot initiative Proposition 122 in, Cal in Colorado in 2022. In 2023, we have a handful of cities that have passed um, local policy reform, as well as um, the mayor of Minneapolis issuing an executive order deprioritizing enforcement of natural psychedelics. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well and the different pathways you can take to enact policy reform at the local and state level. It's actually more approachable and attainable than you might think. But we had Ferndale, Amherst, Jefferson County, Salem, Berkeley, Portland, and Eureka this year at least. If there's more this year, please send it to me in the chat so I can update my PowerPoint. Um, but, you know, as I said, from 2019 to 2023, we have about 25 plus cities that have passed local resolutions uh, deprioritizing the law enforcement of engaging in non-commercial activity involving natural psychedelic compounds. And we'll kind of parse out the different ways because I think it's important to understand how this gets done so that way you guys can do it wherever you live. Um, but to, to kind of summarize, Denver was really the only city that is psilocybin specific as it was a first mover and it was a ballot initiative you know I don't even it, we were still teaching people what psilocybin even meant let alone including ibogaine and other compounds in there but you know the decriminalized nature resolution framework has been incredibly successful and has really served as a model for almost all of the other cities that have passed this type of legislation. So now how do we do this where we live, right? Because that's my favorite question. Um, the primary pathways to local policy reform are as follows. So there's the city and town council or your governing board of wherever municipality you live. And this is going through, you know, your typical legislative process where one of the members of, let's say city council, would propose an initiative or, or excuse me, propose a resolution or ordinance. With this approach, it's almost always resolutions. We haven't seen too many ordinances get passed this way. And I'll talk about the difference between those two on the next slide. But um, they would propose it sort of like you would at the state level with the legislative bill. 
And then, you know, it'd be negotiated and lobbied and then their town council would do a vote on it and then pass to either adopt or reject the resolution. There's been, um, and I'll talk about it later, but most of the cities that have passed policy reform have passed it through this route. Now it's funny because Denver was the first mover and there's no way that the Denver city council at that time would have adopted what we proposed. So, you know, where you have a really conservative city or town council, the voter initiative, the all their alternative is really kind of your best bet. It's a bit more expensive because you have to go collect ballot um, signatures to get it like there's a petition process. So you write your law, you know, you apply to have it created as a petition, then you go get signatures for the petition and you submit those signatures. If the signatures are determined valid, then it can go to the election and the local election and then all the voters of that municipality would vote to either adopt or reject that ballot measure. So that's been, and you'll see this on another slide, but Denver, DC, Detroit, all were ballot measures that were adopted via voters. So that's something to think about when you're trying to decide, can I do this and how? Um, if you know someone on local or city council that is open to psychedelics and you know wants a platform, then that would be the most efficient approach would be to have them propose policy and we're happy to write that policy we'll do most of the legwork there's all sorts of nonprofit organizations that will help you with that process um, but you have to know someone so this is where we tap the network the other way that we're seeing that's new is the statement of policy which is you know really essentially a person in power at the local government that makes a statement saying hey for example in washington county Michigan, the district attorney said, issued like a enforcement policy, which said, we're not going to prosecute crimes, you know, like low level crimes involving psychedelics, and, you know, adults engaging in psychedelic use. And that's it, you know, he decides what criminal cases are prosecuted on behalf of the city or county, excuse me. And he has the power to, you know, engage in enforcement discretion. So how powerful, you know, it only took one person to really have an impact there. Ad additionally, as I mentioned, in 2023, we saw the mayor of Minneapolis issue an executive order, which is essentially the same thing as these resolutions. But it was just one guy who said, hey, this is, you know, my position. This is my desired policy. I don't believe that we should be engaging in the arrest or prosecution of adults engaging in their personal use of psychedelics. So there's a few different ways to get creative here. Um, but it's, again, like I said, there's more opportunity than you might imagine. So primary types of local legislation, it is important to understand when you're trying to get a feel of what's going on at the local level when it comes to psychedelics is ordinance versus resolution. So an ordinance is a law passed by municipal governing authorities, such as city council or county board of commissioners, they are binding. They typically go in the municipal code. It's like the equivalent of like a local statute, like what you would have at the state level, but in local law. Um, as I see here, you know, like ordinances are local pieces of legislation. So it only applies to that city or municipality. A resolution is typically less formal than an ordinance. It's often non-binding, which when we talk about local psychedelics regulation, um, binding is really an argument. Um, that is squishy because as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, controlled substances, psychedelics are regulated at the federal and state level. Local policy is, is really like an assertion of what they believe is best for them, whether that's enforceable, whether you know state, state law enforcement, put very simply, state law enforcement can still enforce in a local municipality that has adopted a decriminalization measure. So even though your city has decriminalize psychedelics, it does not eliminate all of the risk of arrest or enforcement because psychedelics, unfortunately, are regulated at the state and federal level. So only state and federal laws can solve that problem in a concrete way. That said, resolutions have been the most you know, common approach taken by city council, pretty much because it is really just a statement of authority. They're not going to go you know, prosecute a cop if a cop decides to enforce, but it says, hey, you know, police officer, we prefer that you not do that. And in practicality, they seem to have essentially the same impact. 
but important to understand. So both, you know, any kind of local policy is not technically a concrete protection. And then a resolution is even sort of less of a protection than an ordinance. But in practicality, reducing arrest at the local level, very important. And we love that. As I mentioned, citizen initiatives. So this just kind of talks about the petition process, but not every city has this ballot initiative process. You'd have to look. I'll talk about this a little bit later. Only 26 states have a ballot measure process. So it's not available everywhere. If you do have it, it's awesome because you can really get a group of like, you know, advocates together and, and make something profound happen without having to go through politicians and, and that sort of process. But again, it's not available to everyone and it may not make sense um, in your situation, especially if you have, you know, favorable uh, local local governing authority that would that would pass it through the traditional measure. It's much cheaper. So when you're drafting a local policy reform measure, here's some things to just think about, because I really want to inspire people to continue this movement in 2024. Um, what you want to do first is you want to read your local municipal code for low hanging fruit. So, you know, as I will reiterate again and again, and I hope people share with everyone that local policy reform cannot concretely protect you from arrest and prosecution. That said, there are sometimes local laws that address controlled substances. They're not going to regulate it like state and federal law, but there's things like nuisance and loitering and like maintaining a residence that involves the use of controlled substances that are illegal. And there's, and paraphernalia is a big one. And so you want to read your municipal code to see, is there anything in there that we could actually change at the local level? In which case, if you can eliminate a like a law that's in the ordinance or in the municipal code, then you are actually like affecting like technically legal change at the local level. Um, paraphernalia is a big one to look at because there's a federal exemption for paraphernalia. But so review your local municipal code. Think about what activities you want to protect, cultivation, possession, transportation, use, sharing, sales, you know, it gets a little tricky over there. Um, age limits, do you want 18, 21, 21 sort of what we've seen. There's really good arguments for that being arbitrary, but politically viable, you know, these are those kind of conversations. Quantitative limits, we've been able to avoid that at the local level. And I think that's because of primarily this sort of more policy enforcement discretion theme that these local initiatives have. But at the state level, and we'll talk about California Senate Bill 58, you know, the original version of that had no possession limitations by the time Senate Bill 58 passed the legislature, pretty significant possession limitations. So just things to think about and severability, you always want a severability clause at the local level because of the preemption issue, which says, hey, if you if a court determines that this piece of law isn't enforceable because, for example, federal law overrides it, then keep the rest of the ordinance, but eliminate the part that is a conflict. And so just a note on preemption and then we'll get back into the movement. Um, Preemption is important to understand both the cannabis and psychedelics. The term preemption is used to determine which law will get final authority when there's a conflict between two or more rules or regulation. Example of this conflict, local municipality says it's not a crime to possess mushrooms. State law says it is a crime to possess mushrooms. Federal law says it is a crime to possess, mu possess mushrooms. So the way that our government works is federal law always trumps state law, always trumps local law. Now there's creative arguments you can get into is what is actual preemption, you know, can, there's all sorts of lawyer things we can talk about, but that's really the crux of the, what we're talking about when it's like, are these laws enforceable, can you really assert legal protection under local law for something that's illegal under state and federal law, and this is the same stuff we're seeing with cannabis when we have 39 states that have some sort of cannabis program, but federal law still treats cannabis as a schedule one controlled substance seems to be operating okay, but um, all sorts of arguments you can come up with. Lastly, before we move on to the state level, and this is actually applicable to state policy, is 
decriminalization versus legalization. So it's important to know that decriminalization is the removal of criminal charges and penalties applicable to engaging in a certain activity. So let's say that, you know, possessing two ounces of mushrooms came with six months in jail and a $500 fine and is charged as a misdemeanor. That's criminal penalties. Decriminalization would remove at least the requirement that you spend six months in jail and the treatment of the crime as a misdemeanor. It would be changed to a civil offense, for example, and maybe the fine would stay in place. But it's really not legalization. It doesn't authorize you to engage in activities. It doesn't, you know, eliminate the risk of repercussion, but it removes the risk of you going to jail and having a criminal record for engaging in that activity. Legalization is, in essence, government authorization to engage in certain activities. And so this is, you know, the states that we're seeing. Well, we can use Colorado and Oregon now that if you have a state issued license, you can cultivate and sell psilocybin pursuant to state regulation. So it's usually not like you can do whatever you want, but within its limitations, it is saying it is lawful for you to engage in this conduct and you are not at risk of a fine or other ancillary consequences like community service or other things like that. Even in a legalization regulatory regime, because we're working with schedule one substances, you're still going to see some like weird protections, for example, like employers don't have to allow the use of psychedelics in the workplace. You can still get fired for it, even though it's not a crime. Um, and there's things like insurance providers don't have to provide coverage, even though it's legalized. And, and so we get into this sort of creative policy making where we sort of create new boxes for these regulated psychedelic compounds, as well as cannabis. Um, without sort of changing the scheduling structure, because at the state level, it's just, it's tricky both at the federal and state level, but most of the time what we're seeing is they leave the scheduling in place and then they just remove all the penalties, create authorizations and create a separate like regulatory regime in a new box. Big thing to remember, decriminalization, legalization can only happen at the state and federal level because that's where drugs are criminalized. Primary pathways to state policy reform. So similar to local policy reform, we have the ballot measure process and the legislature process. And in the United States, only 26 states provide for a statewide initiative process. And so Colorado and Oregon both pass their psilocybin access models through ballot measures. So something to be aware of. It's not available everywhere, but it tends to be kind of what the earlier movers use because it's much easier to um, kind of be creative without having the risk of it being, you know, totally watered down throughout the political process. It's more about lobbying and education and funding and, you know, getting people to vote um, for, for your cause. The legislative process is, you know, a proposed law or constitutional amendment presented to the legislature. So both houses, you know, the assembly and the Senate or whatever it's called in your state, and they go through the political legislative process to pass a bill. So types of psychedelic policy reform that we're seeing in America is, you know, this is just some of them. There's, you could come up with more, I'm sure, but, you know, reduction in criminal penalties. We saw that with New Jersey. They passed like a reduction in criminal penalties for psilocybin a couple of years ago. Decriminalization is like the removal of criminal penalties. Um, you know, we're seeing that in Oregon with Measure 110, where they decriminalize the simple possession of all drugs for the most part, um, up to a certain amounts. So it's not like Colorado, but it would just be like a fine and potentially like a rehabilitation program or something like that. Legalization with restrictions and licensing. So we saw that in Colorado and Oregon. And um, that is available, but still very early in that process when it comes to psychedelics. Formation of research committees and their funding for research. I think I have done another slide, but there was about 50 bills this this year that um, were introduced in the legislature that involved the term psychedelic, the great majority of those were the formation of like research committees or funding for research. That seems to be what most states are most comfortable with right now. 
um, you know, if they don't want to actually allow anything, but we'll take a closer look at it. And hey, we'll take that too. Religious exemptions, those tend to be, we haven't seen anything super new with that recently. Colorado's done some interesting stuff with Proposition 122, but it's in there. Um, various states have exemptions for peyote, for example, um, and then medical use and exemptions. And we're seeing that both through like litigation, but also through, you know, potentially one day, like the right to try after things like that, where maybe not everyone will have access, but end of life care or things like that may be like carve outs for potential use. And, um, you know, that could also be similar to like Australia where they legalized or rescheduled psilocybin and MDMA with restrictions for particular indications. So successful state ballot measures so far, as I alluded to, we have Oregon Prop 109 and 110 and Colorado Prop 122. And Oregon passed um, its psilocybin access model as well as its um, decriminalization is the simple way to put it, but they have all sorts of other provisions in there relating to harm reduction and addiction um, in measure 110. Those were both passed in 2020. Colorado passed Proposition 122 in 2022, and that decriminalized personal use, possession, cultivation of psilocybin, psilocin, mescaline, DMT, and ibogaine. So it wasn't all simple possession, but as opposed to just simple possession, which is the case in Oregon, it, it decriminalizes or technically makes lawful the personal use of your natural psychedelic compounds, excluding peyote and excluding ibogaine for um, decriminalization at the present. It also creates a regulated access program for psilocybin, which is akin to Oregon, but Colorado enables you to add additional natural medicines to its regulated access model starting in about 2026. So Oregon is in its licensing process. There are healing centers that are open for business. I am told that there are massive waiting lists. So there's at least a lot of demand. There's a lot of, you know, controversy and um, pushback on pricing and access and equity and all of that, as is to be expected with a first time, you know, piece of law like this, but at least they're starting to accept applications. There are healing centers that are starting to open and there are patients that are being served. In Oregon, you don't need to have, actually both Oregon and Colorado, you don't need to have a particular indication or anything like that. You don't have to have PTSD or depression or, or a particular diagnosis, but you just have to be, I believe it's still 21 years of age and um, you, know, go, you can go for whatever purpose you desire. Both Colorado and Oregon are set up to have preparation sessions, administration sessions, and integration sessions where you are working with a state licensed facilitator who essentially supervises and supports you during your, um, you know, psychedelic journey with psilocybin. Colorado is about to start rulemaking probably in the spring. They're doing listening sessions with their regulatory agencies, the Department of Regulatory Agencies, the Department of Revenue, and there's a couple other smaller agencies that are involved with Colorado. So Colorado won't likely be licensing until at least later half of 2024. They'll start rulemaking in early 2024. So it's probably about two years till we really see things up and running there. But Colorado's will be interesting because Ibogaine has the potential to be included in the regulated access model with psilocybin um, starting as soon as they'd like. And Colorado's also got that competing pretty broad scope decriminalization component where you are allowed to sit in ceremony and use psychedelics with a friend or, you know, another adult. And so long as you're not charging for the, you know, purchase or sale of those psychedelic compounds, that's technically lawful. So pretty big stuff. Those are the first like most um, sort of monumental pieces of policy reform that have been passed at the state level relating to psychedelics. But there are, um, there's a lot going on at the state level too. So we can look at that. So as I mentioned, um, 
you know, for this is just 2023, and this is just a couple examples. I believe there were six bills that have passed this session um, involving psychedelics, and they and they vary. Some are like spending bills, some are you know like appropriations, some tried decriminalization. They've, as I mentioned, with all the different types of psychedelic policy reform, they're they're wide wide in scope when it comes to what state politicians have been trying to get across. But for 2023, there were, to my surprise, um, four sort of research bills that have passed in four different states, um, you know, providing or establishing like an advisory council or a task force or a working group to study what's going on with psychedelics and the potential medical benefits and how maybe we could regulate psychedelics in that particular jurisdiction. So, you know, 50 bills this year in 20 states, that's a big deal. We just started in 2019 with like anything being considered as far as access or like acceptance um, goes. You know, obviously the research has been there for a long time, but this resurgence has really been powerful. So even though we only, I believe it was like six bills and then four were research only, um, pretty awesome. That's that's like significant progress. So we're making we're making good progress here. Um, so unfortunately, this is like a big news and something I worked on back in the day. So we'll spend a slide on California, but California was the first legislature in the country to pass a broad scope psychedelics decriminalization bill through both chambers of the legislature, both the Senate and the Assembly in California. Originally Senate Bill 519 Senate Bill 58 would have made lawful the personal use, possession, and transportation of limited quantities of mescaline, psilocybin, psilocin, and DMT. When it started in 2021 as Senate Bill 519, it included no possession limitations, ibogaine, ketamine, LSD, and MDMA. So it came, it got watered down substantially since its first and second iteration, as well as through the legislative process. But it's still incredible that like the fourth largest economy in the world managed to agree on a bill that would decriminalize small, you know, personal use of psychedelic compounds and they passed it. It's it's really remarkable. That said, Governor Newsom likely has his eyes on higher office and vetoed the bill this fall. It was a very disappointing moment because with how reduced or like how restrictive the bill ended up being. I honestly was surprised that he vetoed it, but California is a massive state. You know, my interpretation of what is, you know, viable for the state is probably limited. Um, and he did state in his veto letter that he is open to a therapeutic access model and, you know, believes in the hope and promise of psychedelics for mental health indications, but wants to see like a regulated access model proposed um, that he would before he would be comfortable with decriminalization. So there are, you know, both Republicans and Democrats working together to create a bill. And I'm told that there was a bill. I have not read it yet, or I don't know that it's been introduced. Um, but that would propose a therapeutic access model for California. So hopefully we got that momentum. It'll be a quick turnaround and there's not, you know, too much change between this session and next session where he can stay true to his promise and we can pass a, an access model. But, you know, decriminalization is much simpler in application and administration than creating a licensed regulatory system that involves funding and taxation and all of those things. Big hope for California though, but disappointing moment. Um, to note on the ballot initiatives in California, both the TREAT Act campaign, um, so that was to create a $500 million or some large number research funding for psychedelic research and therapy. It withdrew its initiative to seek the 2024 ballot. I believe that was maybe last month or something like that. Um, they did some polling and said, you know, while Californians want mental health access involving the psychedelics, they weren't sure that the state was the best, you know, body to do that. Um, and excuse this, um, the decriminalization, the decriminalized California campaign, which is specific to psilocybin, it is collecting signatures. So from what I'm told, that is still alive and they are seeking to make the ballot for 2024. So lots going on in California. Really big move with Senate Bill 58 passing, but didn't quite make it all the way through to um, 
its effective date, unfortunately. And it would have also had a delayed effective date to 2025. So kind of an example of the legislative process versus the ballot measure process. You can't amend the ballot measure before it gets passed. Um, it, and then after the legislature, you have the whole you know state being like, this is what we voted for. So there's a lot more pressure to maintain the integrity of the bill. Even though Colorado did adopt a 72 page bill implementing the act that passed via the in legis uh, via voter initiative, um, ballot measures, like I said, are able to be more creative because you're not you're not working with politicians that need to seek re-election. So primary pathways to federal policy reform. You guys, I hope you are feeling inspired and ready to change some lots. Um, at the federal level, there are three primary ways to enact federal policy reform involving controlled substances. So obviously changing all sorts of laws requires different things, but this is for controlled substances. And the primary way is administrative action, which is through the DEA administrator. And that can happen either on his own motion, which doesn't really happen, at the request of the Secretary of Health and Human Services, which can happen when like there's a drug that receives FDA approval. So the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the FDA are very close. Um, and so that then they would submit a request. And actually, there's another example of this happening. And then the DEA would engage in a regulatory action to do a scheduling change of a psychedelic. Or you can also petition to anyone in the public can petition to have a controlled substance um, rescheduled or descheduled. And we've seen that multiple times with cannabis. They've all been rejected thus far. And we also saw it with psilocybin um, more recently now. And so there's litigation suing the DEA to essentially, you know, provide more of a uh, actual rational basis for rejecting these kind of applications. So really cool kind of arguments happening in that space. But the administrative action is really, you know, like the petition process and the rulemaking process. So there's a variety of factors the DEA would consider when it makes scheduling determinations, sort of grouped within that high potential for abuse, medical use, accepted treatment in the United States. And then they engage in an administrative rulemaking. Additionally, you know, Congress can pass a bill just like the state legislature can pass a bill to enact scheduling reform. So we saw this with the 2018 Farm Bill, which changed the definition of marijuana to legalize hemp. So it's possible they did make an amendment to the CSA. They carved out this fresh definition of hemp from the definition of marijuana. Congress has the power to do that. Whether they will do that is its own consideration, but another mechanism of impact that's possible. And then the third and sort of least likely is through judicial action. It is possible. So a federal court could, you know, and this is what happens all the time, you challenge a law and the court reviews it and says, hey, like, is this constitutional? And if they determine that, for example, the regulation of psilocybin is not constitutional because it shouldn't be classified the way that it is, um, you know, it could strike that law down and either, um, or, or order the DEA to affect a scheduling action. Judicial bodies generally really heavily defer to the regulatory agencies. They're like, that's not our ballpark or they, for the most part. <laughs> um, so it's hard to get that. It's hard to get changes made through judicial action because they tend to punt to Congress and, and the DEA, but it's, it's possible. And we're seeing some creative arguments happen there when it comes to like um, access. So, I wanted to share this. This is cannabis, also a hallucinogen for purposes of federal law. You know, people can go back and forth on whether you want to call it a psychedelic or not. But when we're talking about psychedelic law landscapes, it's helpful to understand because cannabis is sort of the gateway. You know, that's what started the decriminalization movement. And that's really helped um, it go as quickly as it ha has because we've been able to show that, hey, you know, maybe the government was wrong and how it treated cannabis, sort of the lowest hanging fruit there. And we're able to get that sort of open-mindedness with other psychedelics now. Um, so just to note, and I'm going to be quick. Okay, two more slides are good. Um, on October 6, 2022, President Joe Biden asked the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Attorney General to initiate 
a review of how cannabis should be scheduled. He did this when he also pardoned a variety of possession offenses at the federal level. And this was kind of his like big cannabis moment last fall. Um, again, everyone says didn't go as far as it should have gone, but a big deal for a president to do that. On August 29th of this year, the Secretary of Health and Human Services issued a recommendation to the U.S. that DEA that cannabis review is scheduled from one to three. So schedule one, you know, no accepted use in treatment in the United States, high abuse potential, no legal administration. Schedule three is for drugs that may be prescribed with a prescription and have moderate abuse potential. We're not going to get into it in this presentation, but ketamine would be your schedule three buddy. So available via prescription, but still regulated. What that actually looks like for cannabis, we don't know. They still have to go through that rulemaking process that I talked about. And so it could take you know, with the election coming up, hopefully they'll expedite it because I think he really needs it, but um, could take months or years to go through that process. But just an example of showing that like this stuff can happen. And this is after decades of petitions for rescheduling cannabis being rejected. Finally, the president said, hey, look, we have like 40 states with cannabis programs, all of this research. I'm going to ask you specifically DEA to take a look at this or HHS and then the DEA. And so, you know, just to show you this can happen, akin to psychedelic schedule one hallucinogen, working its way through the federal policy reform process. Application for MDMA. So MDMA, not technically a hallucinogen, has psychedelic pro properties, um, you know, it's completed its phase three clinical trial. So it's going through its, you know, drug application process. And um, you know, unlike where the federal government, the president, you know, directs a scheduling review, this is where that private party maps in this case is the drug developer, and it's going to apply for the FDA to receive approval as an prescribable drug. And when it gets that approval, it must be moved from schedule one because then it, of course, now has accepted medical use and treatment in the United States. And that same process is triggered where it will the, the FDA will propose a scheduling. From what I hear, it's likely going to be scheduled too because there is dependence potential with MDMA, um, but can be used. And this is going to be, you know, like uh, in psychotherapy. So this is MDMA with um, assisted psychotherapy, whether we won't get into like whole off-label discussions or anything like that, but um once it approve, once it applies for its drug approval from the FDA and is and that's granted, then MDMA and whatever designation they provide MDMA for will be rescheduled in the Controlled Substances Act too. So you can see how this sort of happens at the federal level. We've had no movement for a very very long time, and now we're really seeing like this stuff could actually we could actually see some maneuvering to the Controlled Substances Act and not just adding more research chemicals. But other federal developments, just to note on, and we'll jump to questions, um, which I think should be perfect timing. We're seeing interest, okay? So, you know, the FDA issued draft guidance in June for um, considerations to sponsors that are developing psychedelic drugs for medical indications. You know, that's a big deal. They, they see that there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of clinical studies that are being run and that are being applied for. And so the FDA is issuing you know, support, which they do for all sorts of other con like drugs that are in development, but taking interest in it. And then in October, we saw a couple things happen. Um, as I mentioned, a federal court of appeals ruled against the DEA in a lawsuit over a Washington state's doctor petition to get rescheduled psilocybin. They said the DEA failed to explain its reasoning when it denied the petition and ordered the agency to provide more competent, complete justification. So here there was like an argument that psilocybin should be allowed to be prescribed as part of the like right to try act for, um, you know, terminally ill patients. And it is going through FDA clinical trials. So it theoretically hits like some of the primary criteria for being able to be prescribed pursuant to that program. But because it's schedule one, it just like is in this sticky situation. And so um, some awesome lawyers have filed, have sued the DEA essentially to get that allowance and they got a favorable ruling. The D, the court didn't push it for to the HHS for rescheduling review, which is what they asked for, but they are going to make the DEA either, I think like grant it or provide like 
logical rationale as to why it was denied because they submitted a ton of research and they were like, how do you need more research when we've submitted this like massive document on all of these studies that are showing medical value and safety of use under restrict guidelines. So pretty cool that that's happening. And then addition for the past like three or four years, probably more, but really in the past couple years, we've seen this like increase exponentially. The DEA proposes significant increases for production quotas. So to support research. So because these are schedule one substances, you have to apply to the DEA with your study, with how much you want to grow, with how many patients you have, with how much is being administered, why you need this amount, and they sort of authorize it. And so based on the DEA registrants, they come up with sort of how much they think they're going to authorize for the purposes of um, satisfying the needs of DEA permittees engaging in research. So pretty exciting. I mean, you'd think that we haven't made a lot of progress because there are still people getting arrested and because, you know, two states in California and those things. But if you kind of dig under the hood, it's been an incredible few years for psychedelics. And I think so long as we continue to do this education and really focus on responsible use, um, we can continue that progress. So thanks, guys. That's my presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Courtney. So wonderful. Um, and such an important topic as we navigate this ever evolving landscape. Um, you know, things are always changing so rapidly. So um, I know we have about like eight minutes or so, seven minutes um, before the top of the hour. So um, we'll dig into some uh, Q&A. Um, so first question here um, is, does it need to be a city or town council, or is this something that can be done at the county level? So I'm guessing um, that was around the time we were talking about decrim. Yeah, so you can have, like, there are like unincorporated, you know, jurisdictions and, and um, there have been policy reform enacted at the county level. It's all sort of like, who is your, you know, whether it's the sheriff versus the police, um, and what impact that has, but you can absolutely enact policy reform at the county level, um, especially with resolutions and things like that. So just be talking to your local government. But again, anyone you can get at the local pol political or law enforcement level to make a statement, progress. <laughs> and I think um, a county in Washington did it. I might be wrong in the county, Jefferson County, maybe? or The Washington County District Attorney did a policy, I know did a ex, excuse me, did a um, the pol enforcement policy. And then I also believe that, let's see here. Where did you think it was? I can pull it up real quick. It was in Washington somewhere. I don't know the county. There's the first the, thing that popped in my head. Fort Townsend, that's a city. Seattle city. Hmm. I think maybe there was one more. Yeah. I, yes. But I do believe you can, you can affect change at the county level too. I'll try to dig it up as well. Yeah, let um, me know. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, all right, there's another question here. John Dennis, hello, um, who is also another fellow lawyer and colleague of ours. Um, you mentioned that there are federal limits on uh, decrimming paraphernalia. Can you say more about those limits? Oh, yeah. So not limits, but so in federal law, there is a provision that states that, you know, paraphernalia like is illegal. And I'm paraphrasing here, unless allowed by your local or state government. So federal paraphernalia laws actually provide an exemption for state and local authorization. So it's one of the local laws that you can actually like argue is completely enforceable at the federal level, at least, because there's an exemption allowing localities to authorize paraphernalia in certain circumstances. So it's just kind of funny worded provision, but I always make sure to include those in local ordinances or policies because um, you get rid of one layer of preemption for the one thing. So that's that's good. Awesome. And I did find that article. I'll drop it in. This I just did a quick search and it popped up a marijuana moment. So yeah, it was a uh, Jefferson County in Washington State that uh, yeah, decriminalized uh, psilocybin or psychedelics. So yeah, looks like you can do it at a, a county level. Um, I think people usually just do local jurisdiction because it might be easier to maybe kind of sway some of those votes. But um, yeah, get out there and, and advocate and get to know your, your local reps. Um, all right, there's another question. Who should we contact to volunteer to help um, lobby local and state governments? I live in Maryland and I'm a local lobbyist for other issues. 
and would like to help pass a local ordinance. And um, Marilyn just passed a research bill in 2023. I'm a clinical social worker and uh, want to help to get psilocybin access in Maryland. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so happy to talk offline as far as, you know, put specific introductions. Decriminalized nature has the most chapters operating across the country. So you can likely find like a Maryland chapter and they do operate independently. So, you know, it's, they use the overarching like resolution and IP, but they are sort of their separate subgroups. So I would look there to see if there's like a Baltimore or at least like one of the larger cities um, organizing already. But otherwise, feel free to email me um, or I, I can save your email as well. Um, and I can help connect you with a few people or at least give you some content. If there's nothing there, I can help with the policy stuff. Awesome. And it looks like uh, Kevin in the chat just dropped uh, their email in there. <clears throat> so yeah, definitely reach out to them. All right. Another question here. Is there any focus on uh, decriminalizing or legalizing psychedelics at the federal level beyond medical use along the lines of what's happening on state and local level? So not, I mean, there have been some bills. There's actually like one bill that seeks to kind of allow whatever the local and state sort of like a coal memorandum um, that would say like, hey, if a local or state decriminalizes it, then we're not going to prosecute. So that would be like a really big deal. Um, and then we're seeing like, we've seen a couple things to decriminalize cannabis. I haven't really seen any bills that have made any significant headway seeking to decriminalize um, psychedelics at the federal level. But we are seeing like exemption legislation, like hopefully, you know, maybe veterans or certain indications and things like that, but nothing like just removal of pe criminal penalties to my knowledge. Awesome. Um, looks like we have two minutes left. How are you doing on time? Can you go over a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I can take a couple more. Okay, cool. All right. Do you have any information on federal and state level provisions for traditional use by First Nations or religious purposes, et cetera? Seems to be some older examples of that in the U.S., but are those examples being replaced by uh, generic city slash statewide initiatives? Ooh, I don't know. I mean, I know that like Colorado has some. I know it's out there, but I haven't specifically worked on anything to have a more um helpful answer on that um yeah yeah there i i've worked on the religious use pieces a little bit but not so much on like tribal lands or anything like that mm -hmm. they do have different exemptions but i wouldn't be the right person to answer that question and there was another question around religious exemption and how does that work and do you think you could speak to that a bit sure so there's four or five different federal statutes or regulations that address religious use. There's the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. There's the ERFA, which is like, I think, related to American Indians and religious freedom. Um, and then there's a peyote law, and then there's like a land use law. But really, the most popular, the most famous one is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which is a federal law that states that um, you know, the federal government must satisfy a substantial, and I'm butchering the legal standards here, but like um, the federal government cannot interfere with an individual's sincere and religious practice. And so the argument with psychedelics is that a particular compound, for example, peyote is an integral part or sacrament of an individual's sincere religious practice. And it sort of originated from the First Amendment religious freedom laws but it ended up being codified separately due to litigation and there have been cases that have been successful when it comes to dmt and ayahuasca as well as peyote at the federal level um but most of what we're seeing with churches operating across the country are using it as a sort of like prepared affirmative defense where they haven't received they haven't litigated to get DEA authorization. They haven't applied to the DEA for a DEA permit, but they're operating on the basis that if they were to get in trouble, you would have to prove that the use of your psychedelic is an integral part of your sincere religious practice. And if you're able to satisfy that burden, then the government has a very high bar in being able to prevent you from engaging in that activity, where most people sort of don't where most people fail in the case law is when it comes to the accoutrements of religion. So 
you know, do you have a foundational text? Do you have a like belief system in place? What is your membership protocol? Do you meet, you know, like all of the things and Hey, who am I or the DEA to say what sincere religious practice, but these are the kind of things that courts look at. And so it's a federal statute. There are religious freedom protections in place at the federal level. But again, as you guys are all well-versed on now, not every state has adopted a Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So in those cases, you need to see if there's one at the state level. And then if not, you know, there's certain states that have stronger First Amendment religious freedom protections, but it's very nuanced. So um, something you definitely want a lawyer to look into with you. Awesome. Thank you for that. Looks like we have uh, two more questions, and I think they are kind of similar. But before we ask that, uh, uh, ask these questions, I just want to give a shout out to our vital program. So this webinar is also in collaboration with our uh, our vital training program that Psychedelic State puts on. It's a twelve month training program. Um, if you're interested in uh, checking this out, I'll drop it in the chat. But it's just vitalpsychedelictraining.com, and Courtney is one of our uh, presenters each year, which is always uh, really amazing. Uh, we currently have our applications open until December. 20th. So if you want to check that out, um, definitely go over. Um, it's, a, it's a really fun time, uh, really intensive program, and um, you'll learn tons if you're looking to um, make a shift and, and get more involved in this field. Um, so the two questions, and yeah, maybe I'll just ask them together because they seem um, somewhat um, similar. Are there any policy initiatives um, to change how these substances can be studied since it's prohibitive and expensive? And then um, organs access is obviously over burdensome um, and not uh, equitable. Is there a push to create better policies where everybody can have access regardless of treatment protocols um, or treatment protocol needs and so socioeconomic status um, and what considerations for equity and access when it comes to policy making? Oh, okay. Um, so when it comes to research, yes, there's a lot of different pieces of legislation that have been introduced and are being worked on to try to remove barriers to access for research because of its schedule one classification it's incredibly onerous and expensive and difficult to engage and, and receive the DEA authorization to engage in access as I mentioned they are increasing quotas they are providing more ability but the hurdles are the same and so there are um arguments or bills and different pieces of legislation seeking to remove some of those barriers to access or expand the access that is available. Um, and decriminalization is really that second piece of the equation that I am such a proponent for um, when it comes to ensuring people of all walks of life and backgrounds and use practices um, you know, aren't put at risk for engaging in that, engaging in psychedelic use. But Colorado is going to try to make something that's a bit more accessible. You know, it's always that first mover that has the most conservative, restrictive program, and it's just the way that it happens. Um, so I think we'll see Colorado get a bit more creative with it. But but at the end of the day, it's really that decriminalization component that enables like broad scope access, because if you're paying taxes, you have to have security, you have to have compliance, you have to download software, you have to use track and trace like you have to get testing, you have to get your license, you have to have a property, like all of these things make it incredibly expensive to operate one of these businesses. And then on top of that, you have 280E, which is a tax provision that really makes it hard to make state level businesses engaging in activity with schedule one substances profitable. So it's, it's a tough situation. Um, but I think as we continue to progress with policy reform, we will see more creative ways for people to get access, whether it's like state insurance or like some sort of state run scholarship fund or things like that, because it isn't, it isn't accessible, honestly, right now. It's, it's just not. The growing pains of the field, right? Yeah. It's, uh, it's not going to be perfect, but at least we're, we're making uh, progress and, and steps forward. Um, one other question, and then we'll close out here, is just about uh, training. So becoming a psychedelic assisted therapist is a goal. However, um, does it make sense to get uh, the training before treatment is legalized? So with our vital training program, I like to say that, um, you know, if you're really interested in um, getting kind of deep dive and kind of getting ready for this kind of psychedelic wave, um, it's really great to get ahead of it, right? So there's only a few legal ways to get involved as a psychedelic assisted therapist. One will be through the MDMA assisted MAPS training. Um, once 
and if MDMA becomes uh, legal for um, treatment and, and therapeutic use. Um, and then we can look at the two state trainings. Um, the only one that's really up and running right now is in Oregon, um, where you can go to a, a licensed um, training program in Oregon and become a, a psilocybin facilitator. And then, um, as Courtney was mentioning, we are we still don't know what the, the rules and, and regs are for Colorado once they come online. And <clears throat> Oregon has always had a, a residency clause, which is expiring in 2025. So it was really kind of oriented towards Oregon residents uh, as they were kind of getting that off the ground. Um, and uh, yeah, Colorado doesn't sound like there's a residency clause, but we don't know um, what those um, are going to look like. Um, and so you know, with that in mind, um, you know, I always think that more states will probably adapt that and it is going to be really confusing, right? Like if people take general psychedelic education programs, will state um, authorities uh, maybe adopt some of the, the training that people went through? Or is it going to be state by state and people are going to have to like possibly retake um, different training programs? And the answer is we don't know, but um, I think it's always good to, you know, if you're interested in getting educated and, and training to get ahead of it and one thing uh, when we were thinking about putting vital together is people are already doing a lot of this work. And so we're really trying to operate from um, a harm reduction and risk reduction lens and an integration lens. And so really training people on harm reduction and risk reduction um, techniques and practices um, because people are doing this work and we want to make sure people are staying safe. And then also a huge emphasis in the integration um, because uh, people are really going to need support after it. And, you know, people are already engaging this in the underground in places where it's decriminalized um, and all that stuff. So we're really trying to um, train and educate providers, educators, advocates to become more psychedelically informed and, and literate. But um, Courtney, you can jump in if you have any thoughts there. No, I thought that out. was perfect. Um, yeah, I think I think it's always helpful if you're passionate about it and cost isn't too much of an issue, then the more education, the better. And you'll see there's a variety of different approaches and flavors to these to these education programs. But if you're, you know, set on this as being a career path for a particular place and you cost as a factor, then then it does make sense to, you know, wait until you're going to whatever state approved program. But I don't think there's any harm. I'm all for more education. So I, I support, um, you know, soaking all the knowledge and you can get. Yeah, and if you are interested in doing any sort of like prep integration, um, and if you are a licensed provider, right, any sort of um, education, I think is, is really helpful to start to build those competencies, right? So kind of getting ahead of it, um, super important. Um, so I'll drop the link um, in the chat again, um, if anybody's interested at uh, vitalpsychedelictraining.com and our applications are open until December 20th. Um, Courtney, thank you so much. Um, it's always such a pleasure. Um, anything that you want to close with, where can people find you and if people have extra questions? Um, sure. Yeah. So um, my email is cbarnes at feldmanlegaladvisors.com. You can find me at Feldman Legal Advisors. I'm on LinkedIn as well as Instagram at the.courtney.era. But it's always a pleasure to speak with you, Kyle. And thank you all for joining in on a Friday to, to learn something with me. So thanks, guys.